Good morning, Four Oaks Church. Pastor Paul here. It is a Friday. Let's check out the date. That would be September 13th. So glad that you've joined us for this last installment for this week of our pastoral devotionals. We've been working our way through Matthew 24, verses 36 through 51. This, of course, is the passage we're going to be preaching on Sunday. And what we aim to do the week leading up to that preaching of that passage is to pull apart that passage together walk through it, ask the questions, and do interpretation, draw out themes, really to help you become, and myself, a better student of the Word of God. Instead of just showing up and digesting theological information or biblical content, uh, these times are designed to walk through the text of Scripture together. And what we've seen is that Jesus has been talking about His second coming. So let me read the passage just briefly review where we've been and then bring things to a close today. So Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the wheel, one will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, My master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him into pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So won't go through the last four days here of our time where we've really pulled this apart except to point you to verse 44, because I think that is the key verse of this passage. It's the key idea. Look at, let's look at that again. It says, Jesus says, Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And those, those are really the, the, the two parts of this passage. And we've spent a good, bit of part, a good bit on the part of the fact that Jesus is returning at an hour we don't expect. It will be completely unexpected. It'll be like a thief in the night. And because of that, we have to be in a posture of waiting, of hopeful expectation. This is in contrast to the destruction of Jerusalem, whose signs were clear. And the end of the temple was in sight. It was within that generation. And there, were certain, there was a certain roadmap that Jesus gave the disciples so that they would know that it was coming, the wars, the rumors of wars, the famines, the earthquakes, and of course the abomination of desolation. Jesus says, it won't be that way with my second coming. It will be that, it'll be the sort of shock it was for the people in Noah's day um, who were just living their lives all of a sudden to be, cut, to be caught suddenly unawares and being swept away and destroyed. Now, the question that we want to end today's discussion with, this week's discussion, is simply this. Therefore, you must also be ready. What, what does that mean to be ready? What, what sort of posture um, does that entail? What, what exactly is it that we are to be doing or not doing as the people of God as we wait and hope, as we wait and expectation, right? Um, Jesus uses words like stay awake. He's, he uses terms like be alert. So, so, so what does this look like? Well, thankfully, we don't have to imagine it. Um, 
Jesus has given us a parable to help us understand what waiting faithfully versus waiting unfaithfully looks like. And so, so beginning in verse 45, he says there are two servants, okay? Which is the one that is wise and patient and represents the one who waits the way God would have them wait? Who is the foolish, evil, wicked servant? Now remember, in this context, servant is not just simply the cook, okay? Um, the, the, the servant is actually the steward of the house. Think about Joseph in Potiphar's house. Joseph wasn't responsible for cooking the food. He was responsible for when the food was served. He was responsible to make the trains run on time in Potiphar's house, to be over all the affairs of the house, meaning he was kind of like the COO. If, if Potiphar was the CEO, Joseph was the chief operating officer. It was, his, it was his job to make sure everything ran as it was supposed to run. So that's the kind of master or steward, I'm sorry, that's the kind of steward or servant that, that has been appointed by the master to oversee the affairs of the home. So there, 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 there's, there's two, two, two kinds of servants. So the first servant is one, you know, the cat's away, the mice will play, right? Parents go out of town, the kid throws a giant party. Uh, the kid acts like the parents are never coming back into town. And so he lives his life accordingly. He does whatever he wants, right? Um, even if there's rules, he ignores the rules. Even if there's responsibilities, he ignores the responsibilities. Essentially, he proves himself to be an untrustworthy son, okay? In the same way, the unfaithful steward is the one who doesn't serve as if they're serving a master who could show up at any time and demand anything. They are serving that master as if they are serving themselves. They, they are, they're looking out for their own interests. They're oriented towards their own, um, own agenda, their own feelings, their own desires. And in, in this passage, it takes the form of eating and drinking with drunkards. This is the exact opposite of being sober and being awake. Okay. Now that is contrasted with the faithful servant. Okay. And what is the faithful servant doing? Okay, um, let's look back at verse 46. And it's, it's so simple what the faithful servant is doing. I think it has, though, profound implications for us. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. That phrase, so doing, I think is to be our mantra. Now, when Jesus says that servant was so doing, what does he mean? He means that servant was doing his job. That servant was doing the things that were assigned to him to do. No more and no less. Now, when we think about what that means for us, and by the way, that term, so doing, it means he carried on, okay? Um, even when the master wasn't there, he carried on doing his job. He carried on running the household. He carried on making sure everything functioned and worked properly and accordingly, according to the desires of the master. So what does that mean for us? Okay, What does that mean to so do as a faithful servant? See, a lot of times we think about the end times. We think about the coming of Christ as the sorts of things we need to do to prepare ourselves, right? We need to build the bomb shelter. We need to get the K rations going. We need to set up the security system. We need to buy all the weapons, all right? We need to build the panic room. We need to build the underground bunker and, the, and such. We need to move to the country. We need to start our own co-op farm. Those are all things that might make sense if this world was all there was. If that's all, if this, I mean, let's preserve life as much as we can on this earth. Let's make it as comfortable as we can. Let's protect ourselves. But in reality, that would not be the right approach, okay? The right approach is to do what God has told us to do. Now, now, I don't mean to be, be coy about this. What does God want us to do? Well, we don't know what God wants us to do until we read his word. And his word tells us in Micah 6, 8, 
who who are you, O oh man? What, what what does the Lord require of you? And what does what does it say to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God? And so, in many ways, so doing for the Christian just means being faithful. It means being responsible. It means being boring, if you want to say it that way, right? It means going, means take, taking care of your family, earning a living, uh, pursuing righteousness and holiness in your relationships, upholding the sanctity of your marriage, being honest in your business dealings. It means prioritizing the work of the local church. All the things that we would look at and say, but Pastor Paul, aren't those so ordinary? Aren't they so quote unquote normal? Do, do, doesn't the end of the world require something else? not according to Jesus. According to Jesus, the faithful servant is the one that when Jesus shows up one day at his second coming, we're simply doing what he's called us to do. Now, let me put a little finer point on that. I do think at the end of Matthew and Matthew's gospel, Jesus does give us a life mission. And so, so doing what God wants us to do means accelerating onto the on-ramp of God's mission for our lives, which is simply this, go therefore into all the world, making disciples of all nations, right? Baptizing them, teaching them to be obedient to all that I have commanded. So, so there is this sense in which we are to be faithful on mission, okay? We are to live our lives not as if this life is terminal, but as if it's eternal. We are to live our lives in faithfulness in a way that maximizes and leverages everything that God has given us in preparation for eternal life, which means there's nothing wrong with making money. There's nothing wrong with recreation. There's nothing wrong with travel. There's nothing wrong with family. All of those are great things if they are done with the larger goal in mind of being on mission of bringing honor and glory to God, of leveraging our lives and resources and families for the sake of the gospel versus leveraging them simply for our own comforts, simply for our own affluence, simply for our own pleasures and desires. In other words, living as if the master is never coming back. Now, what that looks like, the contours of that is going to be, of course, different for everyone, depending on what your station of life is, what gifts you've been given, the resources you have, how old, all that, right? But the mission, the posture is the same. Jesus is coming back. I want to be so doing, I want to be faithful on mission, doing what he's called me to do when he returns. I don't want to be hunkered down in the bunker. I don't want to be reading the headlines every day trying to anticipate the times and the seasons. I don't want to be preoccupied with all of these distractions and horizontal realities of what may or may not be happening in the world. No, no, no. In this world, we will have trouble, Jesus says. But fear not, I have overcome the world, which means by God's grace, through courage, conviction, the power of the Spirit, we can move forward into mission, even as we are so doing, awaiting the coming of Jesus. Okay, that's it for this week. We'll, we'll, we will unpack this text together if you, uh, on Sunday. If you've been with us, you'll have a head start on everything. Otherwise, we'll be back here on Monday picking up in verse 1 of chapter 25, the parable of the ten virgins. But until then, pray that you guys have a great weekend. Lord, go with us. Help us to live expectantly and in hope to be faithful to do what you've called us to do. Lord, we ask all of these things in your son's name, and we do pray, Lord, come quickly. Lord, we do pray that you would come and you would rescue us from these bodies of sin and death and this world and this reality. You would make all things new. But until that time, we wait on you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, everybody, thanks. See you Monday.